Representation theory of finite groups, lecture 11, Frobenius reciprocity and Fourier transform. Let us start with recalling our setup from the previous lecture. Let G be a finite group and G mod the category of finite dimensional G modules over the field C of complex numbers. Consider a subgroup H of G and let H mod be the category of finite dimensional H modules, also, of course, over the field of complex numbers. Denote by M the index of H in G. So this is equal to the cardinality of G divided by the cardinality of H, and this is an integer. Denote by res from G to H the restriction functor from G mod to H mod. So this functor simply forgets about all elements in G which do not belong to H. And then we have the induction functor ind from H to G, from H mod to G mod. In the previous lecture, we gave an explicit definition of this functor, which we will recall on the next slide. So to recall the definition of the induction, we have to fix a decomposition of G as a disjoint union of cosets where the finite subgroup H acts on the right. So we write G as a disjoint union of cosets where H acts on the right, which means that we in particular choose one representative in each such coset. Then for any element A in G and any of our chosen representatives GI, the product AGI can be uniquely written as some representative G with index which is denoted by J depending on A and I, and then an element H with index A comma I, and this element H is in the subgroup H. And this way to write AGI is unique. So now let V be an H module. For any I from 1 to M, we consider a copy of this H module V, which we denote by GI V. So we should think about this as a copy of V on which we act by the element GI. So we define the induced module as a direct sum of all these copies. So this defines this module as a vector space. And the action of G on this direct sum is given in the following way. For any element A in G and for any element V in V, the action of A on the element GIV, so GIV is an element from GI capital V. So this is by definition equal to the element G with the index J of A and I, and then the element H sub A comma I of V. So here H sub A comma I of V is an element of capital V because capital V is an H module. And then we have this representative G with the index j of a comma i. And for any homomorphism phi from v to v prime, so where v and v prime are h modules and phi is a homomorphism of h modules, we define the induced homomorphism in the following way. So this induced homomorphism acts on the element g i v with the outcome g i of phi of v. So in this way, we define the functor, which we call the induction functor from H to G. And this is a functor which takes as an input an H module and produces as an output a G module. And as was promised in the previous lecture, the main theorem for today is the following statement. The pair of induction from H to G and restriction from G to H is an adjoint pair of functors. So in other words, as usual, induction is left adjoint to restriction. So let's recall what it actually means in detail. So recall that if we have two categories A and B and two functors F from A to B and G from B to A, then the pair F comma G is an adjoint pair of functors, provided that there are bijections for any object i in category A and any object j in category B, and the bijections are between the homomorphism space in B 
from the object f of i to j and the homomorphism space in A from the object i to g of j. And these bijections should be natural in both i and j. An alternative definition is as follows. f, g is an adjoint pair of functors if there are natural transformations, usually denoted by eta, and this is a natural transformation from the identity functor on A to the composition gf, and epsilon, and this is a natural transformation from the composition fg to the identity functor on B, such that the composition of f of eta followed by the evaluation of epsilon at f is equal to the identity natural transformation on f, and the composition of the evaluation of eta at g followed by g of epsilon is equal to the identity natural transformation on g. We will prove our theorem using this first original definition of the pair of adjoint functors. So let us start with describing the setup for the proof. Let v be an h module and w be a g module. So this is what we need to fix in order to speak about bijection. What we need? We need to construct an isomorphism between the linear space of all G homomorphisms from the induced module induction from H to G of V to W and the space of all H homomorphisms from V to the restriction of W from G to H. And we also need to check that these isomorphisms which we construct, that they are natural in both V and W. So let us recall that there is a unique I in the indexing set from 1 to M for which the representative GI belongs to H. So exactly one of the cosets is H itself. And as we saw in the previous lecture, the corresponding subset GIV in the induced module is actually an H submodule, and this H submodule is isomorphic to V. And the H module isomorphism between V and this GIV is given by the map which sends an element V in V to the element, so we have this index GI, and then the element GI inverse V, and this is an element in GI times V. In the next step of the proof, we construct the map in one direction. So now we construct a map phi from G homomorphisms from induced V to W to H homomorphisms from V to restriction of W. So given a G homomorphism phi from the induced module induction from H to G of V to W, let us define the map capital phi of phi as a restriction of little phi to this subspace GIV. We can identify V and GIV as H modules according to how it was done on the previous slide, and we claim that this restriction is actually a homomorphism of H modules. Indeed, given an element little h in the subgroup H and little v in the module V, so we can compute that applying our restriction capital phi of little phi to the element H G I V. So by definition, this is given by restriction. So this is given by phi applied to H G I V. But phi is a G homomorphism, so we can move H out. So this is equal to H applied to phi of G I V. And again, by definition, phi applied to G I V is exactly the capital phi applied to phi and then applied to G I V. Great, so we have now our map capital phi in one direction. Let us now construct map in the other direction. So let us define the map capital psi from the space of all H homomorphisms from V to the restriction of W to the space of all G homomorphisms from the induction of V to W. So given an H homomorphism little psi from V to the restriction of W. So we define capital Psi of little Psi applied to an element GJV as the element GJ times Psi of V. Since all elements of the form GJV generate 
the induced module. This definition extends to the whole of the induced module by linearity. Let us now check that this capital Psi of little Psi is indeed a homomorphism of G modules. So for this, for any A in G and any V in V, we have to compute what will be the image of capital Psi of little Psi applied to A G S V. First of all, as we already mentioned, we can rewrite A G S as G with the index J of A comma S and then times H A comma S. In this way, we obtain capital Psi of little Psi applied to this element G with the index J of A comma S times H with the index A comma S times V. Now we can use a definition and say that the outcome is G with the index J of A comma S and then Psi applied to the element little h a comma s times v. But psi was a homomorphism of h modules, so we can move h with the index a comma s outside of psi, and then we can again use that a g s is equal to g sub j a comma s times h a comma s to rewrite this as a g s times psi of v. And we can use a definition now to write G S Psi of V as capital Psi of little Psi applied to G S of V. And this completes our check. So now we have two maps in two directions, the map capital Phi and the map capital Psi, and then they go in two opposite directions. So let us prove that they are each other's inverses. For this, we first compute the outcome of capital Psi after capital Phi applied to a map little Phi and how this outcome acts on the element of the form GS of V. So if we apply this to GSV, then by definition, we get the element GS applied to Phi of V. But Phi was a homomorphism of G modules, so this is equal to Phi applied to GSV. And so the application of psi after phi of little phi to G S of V produces the same result as the application of little phi to G S of V. So this means that psi after phi applied to little phi is equal to little phi. In the opposite direction, let us compute what happens if we apply capital phi after psi to little psi. And we compute what happens to this element by evaluating it at the element GIV. So this is our very particular GI, which belongs to H. So evaluating this at the element GI of V, by definition, we will get GI applied to Psi of V. But again, Psi is a homomorphism of H modules and GI is in H. So we can move GI inside and get just Psi of GIV. So the image of GIV under capital Phi after capital Psi applied to Psi is the same as the image of GIV under little Psi. So capital Phi after capital Psi applied to little Psi is equal to little Psi. And this completes the proof of this verification. So Phi and Psi are really each other's inverses. Finally, we need to check that one of these maps is natural in each argument. So we check that phi is natural in V and the naturality of phi in W is proved similarly. So consider two H modules V and V prime and let Xi be an H homomorphism from V prime to V. So to check naturality, we need to prove that capital Phi applied to Phi after Xi is equal to the capital Phi applied to Phi after the induction from H to G of Xi. So this is a statement of naturality. And to prove this, let us check. For any element V prime in the capital V prime, we have that the image of the element GI V prime under the map capital Phi applied to Phi after Xi 
is equal to phi after xi applied to gi of v prime. In turn, this is equal to phi applied to xi of gi v primed. But xi is an H homomorphism, so this is equal to phi applied to gi xi of v prime. So now, by definition, the argument here is exactly the induction from H to G of Xi applied to Gi of V prime. And again, by definition, this is equal exactly to capital Phi of little Phi after the induction applied to Gi of V prime. And this completes the check of the naturality in V. And the naturality in W is proved similarly. And this completes the proof of our adjunction theorem. Here is an easy example. Consider the case when the subgroup is just the identity element and V is a trivial H module. Then we know that if we induce from the identity to the whole of G and we induce the trivial H module, we will get exactly the regular module over G. For any G module W, we know that the space of G homomorphisms from the regular module to W is isomorphic to W. So this is given by sending identity element to anything in W. On the other hand, if we restrict W from G to H, so H is a trivial group, it has a unique simple module, the trivial module. So any module is just a direct sum of the trivial module as many times as the dimension of the original module. So the restriction from G to H of W is equal to the direct sum of the number of copies of the trivial H module, and the number of summons is the dimension of W. So in particular, the dimension of the home space from the trivial H module to this restriction is equal to the dimension of W. And so we see that the dimension of the space of G homes from the induced module to W is the dimension of W because the space is isomorphic to W. And we just computed the dimension of H homes from the trivial H module to the restriction of W is equal to the dimension of W. This checks, at least on the level of the dimensions, the claim of the adjunction theorem in this particular case. In a moment, we will formulate Frobenius reciprocity as a corollary of this adjunction theorem. But in order to do this, we will need the following lemma. For any G modules V and W, the dimension of the space of G homomorphisms from V to W is equal to the inner product between the character of V and the character of W. Proof. So we will prove this using the additivity of both sides of this equality. So both sides of the equality are additive with respect to both V and W. So home is additive and the dimension is additive. The character is additive and the scalar product is additive. So using this additivity, we can decompose both W and V as a direct sums of simple modules. So we can reduce the claim to the special case where both V and W are simple modules. In the case when V and W are isomorphic simple modules, then the home space between them is isomorphic to complex numbers. It has dimension one. And we know that the scalar product of the character of the simple module with itself is one. So the Schur's lemma and properties of the character give our claim directly. If V and W are two non-isomorphic simple modules, then from Schur's lemma, we know that the only home between them is a zero home. So the dimension of the left-hand side is zero. And we also know that the characters of simple modules form an orthonormal basis in a certain space, in particular, the scalar product of two different simple characters is zero. And this completes the proof of our lemma. So now we can formulate Frobenius reciprocity. Corollary called Frobenius reciprocity. For any H module V and any G module W, the following equality holds. 
the inner product of the character of the induced module V with the character of the module W is equal to the inner product of the character of V and the character of the restricted module W. So please note that the scalar products on the two sides of this equality are scalar products in two different spaces. So on the left-hand side, we are talking about the scalar product in the space of class functions for the group G, while on the right-hand side, we have the scalar product on the space of class functions on the subgroup H. Proof, by the lemma from the previous slide, we can interpret the left-hand side of the equality as a dimension of the space of G homes from the induced module V to W. Similarly, we can interpret the right-hand side of this equality as a dimension of the space of all H homomorphisms from V to the restriction of W. And by junction, we know that these two spaces are isomorphic. In particular, they have the same dimension. And this completes the proof. Again, here is an easy example how one can use Frobenius reciprocity. So let us determine the multiplicity of the trivial Sn module in the induction from Sn minus 1 to Sn of the trivial Sn minus 1 module. So here we can view Sn minus 1 in the obvious way as a subgroup of Sn. It consists of all elements which fix the element n. By what we have discussed, this multiplicity is given by the scalar product of the character of this induced module with the character of the trivial Sn module. Using Frobenius reciprocity, this scalar product is equal to the scalar product of the character of the trivial Sn minus 1 module with the character of the restriction from Sn to Sn minus 1 of the trivial Sn module. And the later is, of course, the multiplicity of the trivial Sn minus 1 module in the restriction from Sn to Sn minus 1 of the trivial Sn module. But we know that trivial modules restrict to trivial modules, so that multiplicity is 1. So the answer to the original question is that the multiplicity of the trivial Sn module in the induced trivial Sn minus 1 module is 1. And please note, the positive thing is that we did not have to compute explicitly this induced module. So we determined this multiplicity without computing the induced module explicitly. Here's another example. Let us determine the multiplicity of the module Carly S with the upper index n minus 1, 1 in the induction from Sn minus 1 to Sn of the module Carly S with the index n minus 2, comma 1. So recall that this Carly S n minus 1, comma 1 is the complement to the trivial module inside the natural module for a set. Again, this multiplicity is given by taking the scalar product of the characters. So this is because S n minus 1, comma 1 is a simple module. If you want to compute the multiplicity of a simple module with any module, we should just take the scalar product of their characters. Again, by Frobenius reciprocity, we rewrite this as a scalar product of the character of S n minus 2, comma 1, and the character of the restriction from S n to S n minus 1 of S n minus 1, comma 1. And this is, of course, the multiplicity of S n minus 2, comma 1 in the restricted module. So we know that the natural module is a direct sum of the trivial module and S n minus 1, comma 1. We know that the restriction of the natural module is the natural module plus the trivial module. And we know that the restriction of the trivial module is the trivial module. Combining all this together, we get that the restriction of S n minus 1, comma 1 is isomorphic to S n minus 2, comma 1 plus the trivial S n minus 1 module. So in particular, the multiplicity of S n minus 2, 1 in this restriction is 1. So the answer is that the original multiplicity which we wanted to determine is 1.
So in the final part of this lecture, let us briefly discuss the idea of Fourier transform for finite groups. Consider the space of all functions from G to C. Each such function determines a unique element of the group algebra. So if the function is alpha, we denote by u alpha the linear combination of all elements in G with the coefficient given by alpha of G. And this is an element in the group algebra. In other words, we can identify the group algebra with this linear space of all complex valued functions on G. Each element u alpha acts, of course, on every G module. So if you have a G module V, then the Fourier transform of alpha relative to V is the linear operator on V which describes the action of the element u alpha. And the inverse Fourier transform is a way to determine alpha if one knows how u alpha acts on all simple G modules. So now we will go into the details of this. So let alpha be a function from G to C and V be a G module. Definition, the Fourier transform alpha hat sub V is defined as the linear endomorphism of V, which gives the action of the element U alpha on V. In particular, if you fix a basis in V consisting of elements V1, V2, and so on, Vk, then this linear operator alpha hat sub V can be described by a k times k matrix. Example, if we take the group S3, which consists of elements E, S, T, S, T, T, S, and W0, where S is a transposition 1, 2, and T is a transposition to 3, and we take as V the natural S3 module, then let us take the function alpha, which is given by the following table of values. So it has value 1 on the identity, value 0 at the element S, minus 1 at the element T, value 1 at ST, 0 at TS, and W0 at minus 1. So then the corresponding Fourier transform alpha hat sub N3 is a matrix with which the element U alpha operates on the natural module. To compute this, we need to take the matrix with which E operates, this is the identity matrix, with coefficient 1, then the matrix with which S operates with coefficient 0, so it will be 0 matrix, we forget it. Then the matrix with, with which T operates, so T swaps to N3, so this will be this matrix, with coefficient minus 1. The matrix with which ST operates, this will be this matrix, with coefficient plus 1. And the matrix with which W0 operates, W0 is a swap of 1 and 3. So it, the matrix where we have 1 on the opposite diagonal. And with coefficient minus 1. So taking this linear combination, we get the matrix 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0, 1. This is the Fourier transform of our element alpha relative to the natural module N3. Okay, so how can one describe the inverse Fourier transform? So let L1, L2, and so on Lm be a complete and irredundant list of simple G modules. Theorem, the inverse Fourier transform formula. For alpha, a function on G with complex values and an element G in G, the value of alpha at G can be computed by the following formula. 1 divided by the cardinality of G times the sum over all i from 1 to m, the dimension of Li times the trace of the linear operator given as follows. We should take the Fourier transform of alpha relative to Li and postcompose it with the linear operator which describe the action of G inverse on the module Li. So this is the inverse Fourier transform formula. And note that to determine the action of alpha, we need to know the Fourier transform of alpha relative to all simple G modules. Proof, 
we rewrite the right-hand side of the inverse Fourier transform formula using the definition of alpha hat. So we write here the linear operator, which describes the action of u alpha on Li. So this is a linear operator sum over all h and g, alpha of h times h. Using the linearity of the trace, we can move this sum over all h and g out and also all the coefficients. So the right-hand side of the inverse Fourier transform formula becomes sum over all h and g, alpha of h times 1 divided by the cardinality of g, times the sum over all i from 1 to m, dimension of Li, and then the trace of the action of g inverse h on the module Li. So our next step, we now use the fact that trace is linear with respect to taking direct sums. So we can move in the sum over all i from 1 to m, dimension of Li, inside the trace, and then we get that the right-hand side of our formula is equal to the sum over all h and g, alpha of h times 1 divided by the cardinality of g, and then the trace of the action of the element g inverse h at the module given by the direct sum of all simples with the multiplicities given by their dimensions. But we know that the direct sum of all simples with the multiplicities given by their dimension is just the regular G module. So the right-hand side of our formula is equal to the sum over all h and g, alpha of h times 1 divided by the cardinality of g, and then the trace of the element g inverse h acting on the regular G module. But we also know that the trace of the action of any element a in g on the regular module is almost always zero. So whenever a is not the identity element, this trace is zero. And when a is the identity element, this trace is equal to the cardinality of g. So in this sum, almost all summons will disappear. So whenever g inverse h is a non-identity element, the corresponding summon will disappear. And the only summon which will be left is when g inverse h is the identity, which means h is equal to g. And this summon will produce the cardinality of g here, which will cancel the cardinality of g in the denominator. And we will get that the right-hand side of our formula is equal to alpha of g. And this completes the proof of the inverse Fourier transform formula. Let us talk a little bit more in detail about the special case of finite abelian groups. Assume that G is a finite abelian group. Then all simple G modules have dimension 1. In particular, they all correspond to group homomorphisms from G to the multiplicative group of non-zero complex numbers. Let us denote by G hat the set of all such homomorphisms. We know that the number of simple modules for abelian groups is the same as the cardinality of the group. So the cardinality of G hat is equal to the cardinality of G. Given two homomorphisms phi and psi in G hat, we can define their product by evaluating them pointwise. So the product phi and psi applied to G is equal to phi of G times psi of G. And it is very easy to check that this makes G hat into a group. So this group is usually called the Pontryagin dual of G. The Fourier transform of a complex valued function alpha on G is the element alpha hat in the set of all complex valued function of G hat defined for an element chi in G hat as follows. So the value of alpha hat at chi is equal to the sum over all G in G, alpha of G times chi of G complex conjugate. And how can one relate this definition with the general definition for any group? In order to do this, let us first remark that the complex conjugate of chi of g is equal to chi of g inverse. We talked about that. In other words, we can rewrite alpha hat applied to chi 
as a sum of over all g and g, alpha of g times chi of g inverse. An alternative observation is that the complex conjugate of chi of g is equal to the chi star of g, where chi star is the dual module for the module chi. So in other words, we can also write alpha hat applied to chi as a sum over all g and g, alpha of g times chi star of g. And this is exactly the Fourier transform formula for the dual module. So for abelian groups, it's more convenient to use Fourier transforms formulas with respect to the dual module. And then the inverse Fourier transform formula in this case has the following form, that alpha of g is equal to one divided by the cardinality of g, the sum over all chi in g hat, alpha hat of chi times chi of g. And to get this formula, we just insert the definition in the inverse Fourier transform formula for the general case, which was proved above. Finally, let us briefly discuss convolution of functions and Plancherel formula. So given two complex valued functions on G, let's say alpha and beta, their convolution alpha star beta is defined in the following way. So the value of this convolution at the element G is equal to the sum over all h and g, the value of alpha at g h inverse times the value of b at h. Under our identification of the space of complex valued functions on G with the group algebra C of G, this simply corresponds to the product in the group algebra. In other words, u alpha times u beta in the group algebra is equal to u alpha star beta. So here, alpha star beta is a convolution of alpha and beta. Consequently, the taking the hat of the convolution is exactly the same thing as taking the composition of the linear operators, which describe the hats of the factors of this convolution. And this is valid for any G module V. After this, we have the following theorem, which is called Plancherel formula. Let L1, L2, L2, Lm be a complete and irredundant list of simple G modules. Then for any two functions alpha and beta on G with complex values, we have that the sum over all elements G and G, alpha of G inverse times beta of G is equal to one divided by the cardinality of G, the sum over all I from one to M, dimension of Li, and then the trace of the Fourier transform of alpha relative to Li times the Fourier transform of beta relative to Li. This formula looks very similar as the inverse Fourier transform formula, and it is proved literally using the same arguments step by step. As usual, some problems and questions to this lecture. Question one, check the naturality of capital Phi in the second argument W. Question two, determine the multiplicity of the trivial SN module in the induction from SN minus one to SN of the SN minus one module currently S with the upper index N minus two comma one. Question three, prove using Frobenius reciprocity that induction from S minus one to SN of the trivial SN minus one module is isomorphic to the trivial SN module plus the module Carly S with the upper index N minus one comma one. Question four, check with all details that for any abelian group G, the set G hat is a group and prove that the double hat gives us G back. Question five, prove the Plancherel formula with all details. Thank you very much and see you next time.